Kitco Mining special coverage of the Mining Investment Event of the North is brought to you by EMX Royalty Corp. While other projects navigate economic and political risks in more challenging regions, First Mining Gold has two multi-million ounce projects in two of the friendliest jurisdictions in the world. Joining me now is Dan Wilton, CEO of First Mining Gold. Dan, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So let's, uh, let's you have two major gold projects uh, and both of them are in Canada, which is uh, very fortunate for you and I guess your investors. Exactly. Uh, one is right here in Quebec yep. and the other is one province over in Ontario. Let's start with uh, the Duparquet project in Quebec. Where are you now in the development process? Yeah, I'm glad we get to start with the Duparquet project because we never get to start with Duparquet. It's always, you know, we're always talking about spring pool. Uh, so yeah, we're delighted. We acquired this project or consolidated ownership of this project last year. So we'd own 10% of it from about 2016 and acquired the other 90% in September of last year. So it's something we're reasonably new to having our hands on the steering wheel. Uh, it's an advanced stage project. So two past producing mines and a bunch of infrastructure. The mines produced in the 30s to the 50s. Um, and then the project really kind of sat dormant until 2007, 2008. And it got optioned by uh, another company called Clifton Star. Uh, Clifton Star uh, actually optioned the project in 2010 to a Cisco for a year. But in the time from 2008 to 2014, 270,000 meters of drilling done on this deposit over a strike length of a couple of kilometers. Uh, full uh, pilot plant scale metallurgical work done, full baseline environmental assessment done, full pre-feasibility study done like just an enormous amount of work. We estimate about $100 million of replacement value of the work that was done between 2008 and 2014. So fantastic project. We're, we're the beneficiary of all of that work now as we picked it up and really kind of bringing fresh eyes to it in a new environment, looking at um, how we move this project forward. So it starts for us on the environment side um, and establishing environmental baseline around the project and ultimately now scoping a preliminary economic analysis or PEA. And that PEA we're expecting to have done by the end of the summer. So that I think is gonna give us not the answer, but certainly a, a document that's gonna uh, be very helpful for us to have conversations with regulators, with the local community, with the ministries, and with the indigenous community in the area around how we might scope this project going forward. All right. So, and uh, Quebec is very favorable to these types of uh, developments. Obviously, this was these are existing mines. So, them coming back online, it can be potentially very good for uh, for the community, for Quebec, for everyone involved. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the advantages of working in Quebec uh, from the standpoint of a gold producer? No, I'll tell you. And particularly, I mean, not all areas of Quebec are the same. Uh, but where this project is located, which is about fifty kilometers. Uh, north and west of Rouen Aranda. Um, if you drive from Rouen to Timmins, two major, major mining centers, uh, you literally drive over the top of the deposit. So for this project particularly, given everything that's existed there since the 1930s, the infrastructure is fantastic. You've got paved roads, you've got uh, power lines, you know, you've got a town of 700 people that was built around the original mine in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, just all of the infrastructure around, and but most importantly, the access to people, the access to suppliers, the access to contractors. You're in so, mining country yeah, already. Absolutely, you're in mining country. And I think one of the things that, that really strikes us and how that works for a company that's still looking to do quite a bit of exploration around this project, because we think it can get a lot bigger. Uh, we're drilling there now, our first drill program at Duparquet. And we're drilling, you know, at very, very attractive costs because of the proximity and the and the skill and quality of people we're able to get to come to work on the project from a from a contracting and and from building our own team perspective. All right. Now, uh, your other flagship asset is the Spring Pole Gold Project in Ontario. So, uh, what stage are you at? for that project and what's the timeline looking like? Yeah, so Spring Pool is in advanced stages. We put out a pre-feasibility study in early 2021, which showed a very robust project capable of producing 300,000 ounces plus a year. So this is a big mine. Um, we've continued to advance since then, did a bunch of the long lead time work and are now 
I'd say 80 to 85% through a feasibility study in terms of the work that we would need to do. Been doing a lot of optimization work around the flow sheet, optimizing the environmental footprint and some of the environmental processes for the project, particularly the tailings. Um, optimizing mine plans, confirming the process flow sheet to get the recoveries that we think we're gonna get out of it, and uh, doing a lot of the infrastructure, advancing the engineering of the infrastructure around the project. So it's most of the way through a feasibility study. It still needs probably one season of data collection now, which is really somewhere between eight and 10 holes for geotechnical hydrogeological work at the southern end of the deposit. But it's very significantly advanced from a technical perspective. And then on the environmental assessment, and this is where I think it really sets the project apart, uh, we uh, published a draft environmental assessment about a year ago. So that's now been reviewed by all the regulators, reviewed by a couple of the indigenous communities around the project. We've received comments back from all of them, 1,200 comments we got back. We've now answered all of those comments and you sort of get into this uh, comment response back and forth where you're really finding solutions with the regulators to some of the questions or, you know, for the community, some of the concerns the communities might have. So significantly advanced to the point where we're now starting to incorporate all those questions into a write-up of a final environmental assessment that we look to submit formally about a year from now. And then from there, the EA process is, it's about a 12 month review process. Keeping in mind that by the time people have received it formally, they will have been working through the project with all of the data over a two year period. Right, because all, so, all of those previous drafts are, I mean, obviously amount of the material is there. So the final, the final review process is still just very much informed. All the stakeholders are very much informed throughout that process. Exactly, and so it's not necessarily the fastest way to go through an EA process, but it certainly, we think, is the lowest risk. It surfaces any of the real issues really early on in the process so you can work collaboratively to find solutions. And we've had very good collaboration with regulators, both federal and provincial, uh, in the reviews that they've done. Still, you know, a number of issues we need to work through, but I think that's any mining project, and it's not just at the EA stage, that carries right through the life of the mine. Right, and, and some of these are obviously geological challenges. Uh, you're effectively mining in the Bay of the Lake at the Spring Bowl site. Uh, are there some unique challenges to, to that type of, uh, to planning out that type of a mine? Uh, yeah, you know, I, the short answer is none of it's unique. You know, this has been done a number of times in a bunch of mines in Canada. Uh, and including by members of our team. And that's part of the people we've been able to attract to the project are people who've worked on situations like this before. The diamond mines in the Northwest Territories, uh, you know, some of Agnico's mines, uh, particularly the Meadowbank mine uh, in Nunavut. Um, our VP Environment Community Relations uh, worked as a regulator or for the regulators in permitting that project. So, you know, we've seen the building dikes and dewatering lakes. The reality is the further north you go in Canada, the landmass is about 50% water, right? <laughs> in terms of the footprint of lakes. And even the projects in Ontario that are being built now have had significant amounts of water management. You know, projects like Cote, projects like Magino, there's a lot of water to manage when you're in the Canadian Shield. So there really is nothing unique about this. It's, uh, it's in total building about a kilometer of dikes uh, the average height of those is about five meters. So, you know, 15 feet, not very big. The deepest part, I think, is about 14 meters. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's all something that has obviously been a big focus of ours, both in understanding the technical feasibility. We're very confident on that based on, you know, the the um, geotechnical drilling that we've done in terms of where you put those put those dams or put those dikes. And then the process of dewatering, which is done in a lot of mining projects in terms of, you know, whether it's relocating aquatic life, whether it's, you know, managing fish habitat. There's really, again, lots of work to do, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, nothing all, all has familiar to do. work. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I think that's one of the things that's really su surprised me for those who are sort of career environmental assessment people. It's not much of a surprise to them, but for me, it's, it's the receptivity to which, you know, that we've received from regulators for whom a lot of this is not new, you know? So yeah, we've had very, very good collaborative work so far. And I guess that's one of the advantages of these types of jurisdictions is 
uh, these these types of projects have it's all Canadian Shield. You yeah, know, it's Quebec, it's Ontario. Yeah, and uh, these are these are two jurisdictions that are very used to figuring these things out. So they do it right. Yeah, they take their time, but they know that there's uh, they're not it's not anyone's first rodeo, and uh, these things get worked out, and these people are experienced with these types of projects. Yeah, no, it's very true, and that's you know I think when you look at uh, jurisdictions and their permitting track record for all that. Some people kind of wring their hands a bit about the process in Ontario. And I would tell you, the ministries in Ontario are really committed to making the processes more streamlined, particularly the mining ministry. Um, but, yeah, I think as, as we've gone through these processes, you can look at the province of Ontario, and I would measure it up against pretty much any mining jurisdiction in the world in terms of the number of major mines that it's permitted in the last 20 years. And major open pit mines, like in Ontario, you've got Cote and Magino and Hard Rock and Rainy River, you know, some of the Porcupine mines around Timmins, like uh, Generation Mining's got their environmental assessment for a big open pit. So, yeah, there's there's nothing new on that. And you have actually, I think, one of the best track records at delivering permits of pretty much any jurisdiction in the world. So it, so it takes the time that it takes, but it gets there. Yeah, and again, it's it's uh, often it's that collaborative approach. It's regulators that want to make sure that things get done the right way, but it's it's working with proponents to get there, and that's one of the things that you know really does kind of set these jurisdictions apart. And we have the same thing in Quebec on, on the environment side, and the and the mining side with the ministries that we've worked with so far at earlier stages in Duparque. But no, listen, this is. It's a reason why these are tier one jurisdictions, right? And it's a reason why, you know, we're so excited to have two multi-million ounce projects. Because I think what that leads to is that the recognition that these are really, truly strategic projects for the industry. Right. And uh, we, we have been hearing that it, it does take a long time to permit mines. Uh, and finding these types of deposits, finding, getting these things, confirming that they're viable and getting them into production takes a long time. Are there any other large projects like this in Canada that could be coming online between now and, say, 2030? You know, that's an interesting question. We, we have the list of uh, sort of in our, in our investor presentation of the mines that would be, you know, of the similar size and scale to Spring Pool or larger. Um, the reality is you've got six or seven of these big mines in Canada in production or in, in construction right now. So, you know, Cote, Magino, Hard Rock, Back River, um, Valentine, uh, I'm missing another one here somewhere. Uh, but a number of these big projects that are in construction right now, when those are completed, you know, you look at kind of the next 10 projects uh, by size in Canada of things that are really kind of truly on a development path. And inside First Mining, you're going to have two of those top 10. How many, and, and there aren't many of those, or I can't think of any necessarily. Skeena would be one that's sort of in a comparable time frame to Spring Pool, I think. But beyond that, just by virtue of the fact that the industry has not been investing in development stage projects for years, there's not a long pipeline of projects that have been advanced. So yeah, I think you can just look at where a number of projects are um, there's a bunch of larger projects and, you know, Exploration Success will get some of these projects bigger. Exploration Success is going to get our projects larger as well. We're very confident of that. But no, I think uh, from here, you kind of have this five year gap between the projects that are kind of in advanced stages of permitting now and, and when the next ones might be ready. So, yeah, I think we've always said that about Spring Pool. Our goal was to have that project ready, basically when the when when the industry is going to need it the most. Right, and I think we're coming into that point, right? Right, because we're hearing uh, from the other side of the of the conversation, we're hearing a lot of investment demand. I mean, uh, Rick Rule is saying that just to return to the median uh, investment in terms of gold as an investment, just to return to the median, uh, the the average uh, over the last forty or so years, it would be two percent, and right now right. we're at point five of like we're yeah. at half of one percent yeah so and the peak i think was five percent yeah which is no one's even no one's even that daring to predict <laughs> that but even even getting to two percent just on the investment side the demand is enormous and then you have all the other applications for gold for electrification and other things yeah you have a lot of you have a lot of needs there so 
I guess uh, it's a good position to be in to have two major mines coming online at a time when demand is expected to, to increase dramatically. Yeah, it's still a lot of, lot of work to do on that front, particularly at Dupark A, to scope out and understand the timelines for development. But yeah, I think we have a couple of, you know, very, very well-defined projects. We've benefited from all of the work that predecessor companies have done, and it leaves us and our shareholders in a really good position to benefit from some of that historic investment that we, a lot of it made at a time when other people were not investing in projects. And that ultimately goes to, you know, give technical confidence and shorten some of those development windows. So yeah, and listen, I think in terms of the gold investment, um, you know, the gold price sitting where it is just shy of 2000 now, before anyone really cares, you know, we're starting to see sort of some of the smartest of smart money moving into gold. And I think particularly you look at central banks and central bank buying, which is hitting, you know, real records now. Yep. An increasing number of central banks that are adding gold to their portfolio. That's that's just the starting point, right? And those people are years ahead of where your average portfolio investor is in terms of understanding the and value planning of for the long term. Planning for the long they term. They don't need to make money the next quarter. They're Correct. planning for where they're going to be in five years, and so are you. Yeah. So you're you're if you're operating on those time frames, you're uh, they're confirming a lot of your assumptions for the for the coming years. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's exactly it. I think I think uh, you know we could very easily see the demand pick up significantly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. There you go. This was a pleasure, and uh, we we'll, we look forward to hearing more updates from you. Absolutely. Thanks very much for having me. I'm Ernest Hoffman for Kitco Mining. Keep it here for more coverage from the mining investment event of the NOR. And don't forget to subscribe. Kitco Mining special coverage of the mining investment event of the North is brought to you by EMX Royalty Corp.